Welcome to Science and the Written Word. I'm Lou Massa. Dr. James D. Watson is president of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. A member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. He wrote the double helix and also the molecular biology of the gene. He is a Nobel laureate for his contribution to the Watson-Crick structure of the DNA molecule. We are discussing his recent book, A Passion for DNA, Genes, Genomes, and Society. Welcome, Jim. I'm glad you can be here. Well, this book is a uh, collection of essays that span a uh, good number of years, actually. Yeah, almost 40. Almost 40. And uh, the messages I feel in these essays are uh, oftentimes relevant uh, for today, which I think is why you brought them out recently, undoubtedly. Yeah, some of them could... You know, still be read with, I hope, profit. Yes. Uh, could we begin uh, at, at the beginning, your upbringing in Chicago? You do have a little essay about that. Uh, and you talk about your upbringing and how that mattered later. Could you tell me uh, something about uh, the virtues of growing up in Chicago? Well, it was a second city. You... Uh You had to prove yourself. You couldn't sort of live off your family or your wealth or something. It was a, a brash place. And uh, so I grew up in the Depression, and uh, my parents had had a car, but that disappeared at 33. And uh, so my whole boyhood was a streetcar. It was a streetcar that got me to the University of Chicago. And uh, so, Streetcar in the L. So, I see movies now of Chicago and their scenes on the L. But uh, that yes. was my life. Yes. Does, one, uh, does that sort of environment give you a, a, a special respect for the truth as opposed to mannerisms and facade and well, so forth? Well, I think forth? it was the University of Chicago. I think if uh, I'd gone to Northwestern, it wouldn't have been the same sort of. Uh, uh, with Robert Hutchins. Uh, he let a few kids in it after two years of high school, and I was one of those. And uh, you know, we were suddenly in a place where ideas mattered more than facts. You, know, you weren't supposed to just memorize things and regurgitate them as exams. You're supposed to think. I think that was it. And yes, that's so the great so thing. So when I was uh, in Chicago, you know, I, I worried, would I ever have an idea? <laughs> and. Uh, but, you know, fortunately, I realized that, you know, ideas come out of facts. So if you really know a lot of facts, it might generate an idea. But uh, uh, Hutchins, you know, just, you know, said the American high school was mediocre, so it was impossible to reform. And so Read the put, good books. Well, get to college young. And I think probably the last two years of... Uh, American high school still remain things you could do without. You could say, oh, you take all these courses, but you're not there thinking. You're, you're sort of regurgitating in some way. Not inspiring places because I don't think they get very close to real truths because uh, real truths would get you, you know, into political trouble. So the schools try and avoid being controversial. Political correctness yes. at work. Yes, and so uh, uh, the wonderful thing about Chicago was the idea was paramount and the truth was paramount. And uh, yeah, superstition was superstition. And uh, You called it what it was. Yeah, Chicago and... Uh, I think one of my things, you know, it, it allowed me to call crap crap, <laughs> which uh, uh, Harvard would have never let me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought uh, Chicago uh, and served then, you uh, well in that sense. And then another thing was maybe it was now five years ago there was some listing of American undergraduate educations which are the best, or it was really what was the most pleasant school to go to. And Chicago was there as third from the bottom as pleasantness. And uh, there was uh, the most unpleasant schools were the Naval Academy in West Point, and then there was Chicago. 
Johns Hopkins and Rensselaer Polytech. <laughs> These <laughs> seem to be the places you would avoid if you wanted to have a good time. But at least, uh, and then it made me think, Chicago made me an officer. And in reflection and thinking back to some of my teachers, they weren't. Uh, later, uh, you know, I got some serious scientists, but they were sort of staff sergeants. Uh, they were there to sort of drill you to think mm -hmm. and knock you down virtually, you know, if you're, you weren't logical. Mm -hmm. So that was the training, you know, yes. <laughs> uh, think and be logical. And uh, so when I got to graduate school, I discovered uh, my peers. Lack that so much? Yes, they hadn't really been trained to be officers as undergraduate. Now, where would the uh, graduate uh, training begin? In Indiana, I suppose. Yes. And uh, is is this where the Phage group uh, begins? Uh, well, your your you, interaction with it and so yes, forth. Yes, that's where I first came into contact. And so tell us what 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 is the Phage group and who are who who who, well, who it was, constitutes it? Was, it? It was group of uh, I don't think it was ever more than sort of ten sort of senior people uh, and various sort of, you know, younger people, associates, who studied bacterial viruses uh, under the assumption that maybe they were naked genes and uh, they found, you know, they had genetics and genes. And uh, so you could study genetics with possibly the simplest system. And, uh, and they reproduce very fast, so you could do an experiment in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so in a month, you could do a lot, uh, say, unlike with the corn plant, where you might get you know, one crop a year, right. unless you could go to Hawaii or something right. like that. Right. So it was the speed, and uh, many of them were ex-physicists. So who are these guys? What are the uh, legendary names that well, came out I of that? Well, I think the legendary real name was Max Delbruck, the German uh, theoretical physicist, trained in uh, uh, Göttingen and in Copenhagen. Uh, who came to the United States in 37 and went to Caltech uh, wanting to do genetics. But at Caltech, he discovered someone was working with bacterial viruses. And uh, then there was an American, uh, Alfred Hershey, who was a physical chemist who came out of Michigan State and then had a job at Washington University. And he, he started working on pages and met Delbrook in 43. And the third was. Salvador Luria. Now, this is your advisor, actually. Yes, and he came to the United States in uh, uh, 1940 uh, with the fall of France. He was Italian, fled Italy, fled Mussolini, went to France, then had to flee France. He was a Jew and arrived in New York in the fall of 1940, was given a temporary position at the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons, and uh, then uh, I came out to the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium in 1941 and met Delbrook. And uh, he would have read Delbrook's things before, but that's where they met, and then they decided to do joint experiments together at Cold Spring Harbor that summer. And, uh, and you got tied up with this crowd and, I and got worked tied with up, them. I got tied up uh, seven years later when I became a graduate student of Luria Early in uh, uh, 19... Uh, 48. Yeah. I'd taken his course the previous term. I went to Indiana in 1947. There's and something fascinating about these guys all being physicists and, or having a big interest in physics and then somehow finding biology. I think it was the, uh, the real goal was to find the gene in the structure. And uh, was Schrodinger part of the well, impetus? Schrodinger, Schrodinger wrote a book, but it was based on a paper of Delbruck, Delbruck yeah. which was written yeah. in 35, yeah. 36. And uh, so I had read Schrodinger's book when I was a junior at the University of Chicago, and it changed sort of my vocational ambition from being a naturalist to being a, a geneticist. So. Uh, now I realized that in undergraduate education, Chicago sort of it gave me a goal for my rest of my life. You know, I had an intellectual objective. So when I went to graduate school, I didn't just go to graduate school uh, 
because the school was good, I wanted to go to a place where genetics was good. At that time, there were two places in the United States, Caltech and Indiana. Mm -hmm. And you were at Indiana. And I went to Indiana because Caltech rejected me. But I think Indiana, for my purposes, turned out to be better. Uh, Luria was a, a very good teacher. Delbrook was not a very good teacher. And, uh, so maybe it was lucky that way. Oh, I was very lucky. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got uh, someone who really gave me the supervision I needed for a couple of years. And, and did Luria uh, push you in the direction of trying to study chemistry and physics no, in particular? No, not at all. Not at all. No, he, he had an irrational disdain for chemistry. Oh, how surprising. You know, well, you know, physicists look down on chemists. And, you know, he'd spent a brief period in Rome and had met Fermi and that group in, I think, 1936. 37, a Maldi, that, yeah. that group. And yeah. So he had this reverence for great physicists. And Lurie was a very uh, inconsistent in his thoughts. You know, he was a, a leftist, but. Uh, Politically, yeah. Yes. But, uh, and so, you know, chemists were connected to industry, and industry was bad. But uh, you know, he became a consultant to DuPont when they offered him money. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So, inconsistent. <laughs> so he was inconsistent. <laughs> well, and, uh, but, uh, so Luria had this disdain, and Delbrook did too. Uh, you know, they wanted to, they almost hoped there would be new laws of science which would govern biology, and chemistry was rather I find boring. That, I find that interesting, that these uh, physicists were kind of searching for a new law to explain biological behavior. Now, that seems not ever to have happened. The laws in no, uh, uh, physics and chemistry seem to be totally adequate. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And uh, so I had Lurie as a teacher, Delbrook, but the, the person who you know, I thought probably was going to you know, get the truth would have been Linus Pauling because he was the, you know, the, the chemist interested in yes. biology and interested in the big molecules, that, uh, the enzymes and uh, nucleic acids. Luckily, Pauling was always more interested in proteins than nucleic acids and never spent much time on it. So he, uh, and he had great success with the structure of proteins, in fact, with the alpha helix and so With on. the alpha helix yeah. and the, the beta sheets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, you found your way to Cambridge after the Ph.D., though, at Indiana. Yeah, First, I, you went, I don't know, to uh, probably to Bohr's... Uh, yeah, well, because of uh, the Copenhagen was a great place for physics. Uh, Delbrook and Luria thought Copenhagen would be a good place. But, in fact... By uh, this time, though, you, you, you were obsessed with working on the gene, and Copenhagen wouldn't have been the place to do that, right? Well, it wasn't the place to work out the three-dimensional structure of a uh, protein or an nucleic acid. And, uh, I didn't know there was really anyone working on DNA. I think if I, on the three-dimensional, if I had, I might have, you know, a year earlier said I want to go where someone is right. doing it. But I had met Herman Kalkar, and he had a younger brother who had worked for Bohr, and, you know, it was a, a small world. Right. Uh, so... Uh, but eventually, uh, you were encouraged to go to Cambridge. Uh, no, I, I wrote them I wanted to go to Cambridge. They didn't send me to Cambridge. Uh, I think that was my own. Your own uh, idea? Yes. Okay. I think they, uh, Delbrook thought, well, you know, I'll go there and I won't find the truth and I'll come back to Caltech in his sort of world. But yes. when I did come back to Caltech, it was, I didn't want to go back to the phage world, even though. It was to yield some very marvelous science. I had become. Uh, you were. But I met Francis Crick. You know. You were following Francis' uh, way of thought. Uh, you know, I found uh, more interesting than Delbrook. So you know, I yeah. <laughs> uh, Francis became the one, and Francis w uh, w himself w was, you know, trying to think like Pauling, but you know, maybe do it better. Yes. Was Crick, uh, in terms of his way of thinking, was crystallography important to him, and was he something like an expert theoretician in crystallography and that sort of thing? No, I mean, he wasn't, uh, uh, he was just learning it himself. So, you know, he didn't come up with any f 
clever way to solve the phase problem or something like that. He did work out uh, diffraction uh, pattern expected from helices. Those. By the way, why would he have been working on the uh, diffraction pattern of pattern of helices? Would it have been because the proteins were known to be no, helical? Because of uh, Linus Pauling's alpha helix. Yeah. And uh, that's what I per guess. Perut said. Uh, uh, it taken a synthetic polymer and shown, in fact, the folded up into the alpha helix. So the alpha helix first demonstration that it actually existed was done in Cambridge in uh, uh, the middle of 1951, uh, about three or four months after Pauling's proposal. Now his working out the uh, the X-ray pattern for uh, helices would have been, it's got to be thought of as a pretty lucky thing, wouldn't you say, given the fact that uh, uh, that pattern existed down in King's in London and so on? Well, no, they, they want to do it really to know what, how proteins should diffract. Francis is interested at that time was uh, proteins at, right. at that moment. And because uh, he was working on a form of hemoglobin and... Uh, but, but you came to that group and your interest presumably was DNA. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, my thought, you know, from the moment I arrived, could you guess the structure of DNA in the sense that Pauling had guessed the structure of the alpha helix. Yeah. And uh, Francis, you know, thought, well, why not? And Wilkins said it was going to be a helix, and uh, or thought it was a helix, and they had been calculating in King's what the helices, how the diffraction. And if it hadn't been for Rosalind Franklin's sort of violent opposition to... To the, the concept that it was a helix? Virtually, yes. Or, or I think it disliked that you would solve the structure that way. She, you know, she wanted to solve it the traditional way. Yes. Which, you know, uh, playing with models didn't take any brains. But, you know, doing the other, <laughs> you know, you would respect a person who could do it the other. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, so when we, you know, we found the double helix, it, uh, it was pretty simple. Uh, it was the only way I was going to find it because I really didn't know crystallography, and so if I'd had to do it by brute force, it would, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have been. It, that wasn't your tools. I mean, no. I, uh, so the modeling. You know, I the guess maybe I would have learned crystallography if that was the only way to go. But I thought, why don't you just give model building a, a chance? A chance. Yeah, and it worked. If you fail, and it worked. Now, let, let me ask you this, since this is such a, a seminal uh, in invention in the history of biology and so on. When you went to King's and saw the pattern and sort of brought the idea back to uh, Crick and looked it over and so forth, uh, talked it over, what was the psychological impact on you and Crick rather well, knowing what the, what the pattern looked like? I mean, well, you guys cross. put that... It was a cross. Right. And uh, the theory said it should be a cross. And it was a perfect cross. So he said, it's, you know, if it's not a helix, you know, <laughs> it's bizarre. So, you know, just assume it was a helix. But, the, but did that set you to model well, building with a vengeance, so no, to speak? No, the, the real vengeance came because Pauling had just published this... Wrong thing. Wrong thing. Yeah. So, and it was the humiliation that the Cambridge people felt when they didn't get the helix. Uh, they had tried in 1950 and uh, had said, well, it's got to be an integral, threefold or fourfold. They never said it could be 3.6 residues per turn. Which came out of the structure, uh, the uh, you know the uh, bond angles and bond lengths, mm -hmm. and uh, so they felt pretty humiliated. And Bragg, at this point, knowing that Pauling had had failed, didn't want Pauling to you know finally get the answer. And even though Rosalind Franklin, at this time, was changing her mind and would soon look at the data and conclude that it was a helix. Uh, she, to our knowledge, she hadn't. And, uh, we just saw her as someone who would never accept the helix. And uh, uh, therefore, we built the models. They, so when we got it, we never felt, well, we'd stolen it from Rosa. We thought, we just had never tried to get it. Uh, well, Wilkins, it's clear Wilkins, she didn't build a model. No, and Wilkins, who would have built a model if it hadn't been for the whole thing, uh, we felt very awkward with regard to Morris, but he should have been part of the team. And when he got the Nobel Prize, we felt good. But I think, you know, 
he didn't get the structure, and uh, you know, he just wanted, you know, Rosalind was going to leave, and then he could take up uh, where he had been in September of 1950. You know, it was a year and a half had passed. And yes. Uh, now you could have said, well, he shouldn't have not worked on it. He should have just told Rosalind to go to hell. Or, and, uh, but he wasn't that sort of person. Yes. Well, once you guys got this uh, beautiful thing, the, the, dub, the double helix, it was apparent to you immediately, I guess, how important this was and what it would lead to and so yeah, on. Yeah, because it solved the, or provided a solution to how, you know, you could copy the information. And uh, Pauline, in fact, had said, you know, you're going to copy my complementarity three years before. He'd given a lecture in Manchester. And yet when he proposed the structure, he never was thinking about, well, how would you, what sort of molecule could be copied? So Pauling's failure to get it, I, I tell people that the only person who could deal with the sort of bizarreness of the whole thing would be Tom Stoppard. You know, he could write a play, <laughs> you know, which right. Pauling and his wife are there, you know. <laughs> and why didn't it happen? Yeah. Why didn't you do this? Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, people say, you know, were we lucky in, in getting it? I say, yes, we were very lucky that it wasn't solved either by Rosalind and Morris or by Pauling. We got it by default because it was waiting to be solved. Yes. There was enough data that, in fact, you could have proposed the structure without Rosalind's photograph because any rational person would say, well, it's going to be a helix and just make a helix and you know roughly if you build models, uh, change light to repeat about every 30 angstroms or so. So you'd have built it. And there was Shargaff's data, and uh, there was Gowan's data, which said the bases were hydrogen bonds. It was all there in the literature. Yeah. But uh, you could say, well, maybe each of the data could have some other interpretation. But if you took this simple minus straightforward interpretation of all, why are things present in equal numbers? Because they touch each other. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. that sort of, uh, and it was the way Pauling was trained to think, and yet he didn't do it. He didn't quite he, do it. Well, he went off. He, he went off the, with that triple helix well, idea. Well, he was dominated by wanting to pack phosphate groups together. Pauling was really an inorganic chemist, a very, very successful inorganic chemist. Yeah. And he just loved things like phosphate groups. You know, he'd, his great early success was silicates. Yeah. Now, um, in terms of uh, the speculations that would have occurred right after the structure, you must have been wondering very quickly about how does the information in DNA get over into the proteins? Yes, I mean, uh, we would worried about it before, but we sort of thought until you get the DNA structure, it's not really worth speculation. The moment you had it, then and even before we had it, I said, well, it's got to go through RNA uh, because uh, the cytoplasm had no DNA, and yet that was the cytoplasmic synthesis. And the RNA had to be doing something. So I had in front of me in my desk in Clare College a little piece of paper which said DNA goes to RNA into protein. Yeah. And, and that has turned out to be the paradigm, in fact. It has the paradigm. Yeah. But that was written that in November of 52. So the moment we had the structure, I wanted to know what the uh, DNA, I wanted to know what the structure of RNA was. And I took an x-ray photo in Cambridge. It was no good. And I thought, well, you know, you get better material, just like the first DNA photos weren't very good. You'll get a better one. But uh, a year at Caltech certainly didn't move us toward anything which was very good. I was going to ask you, when you left Cambridge, I guess you would have left at the end of 53 or something like that. Yes, I was And you went to whole, Caltech. Yes, I had a, another year as a postdoc, and Delbrook wanted me to sort of help run the phage group there. So You did that for a while? <laughs> not really. I'm not very good doing something I don't want to do. He yeah. had two graduate <laughs> students, and you know, he hoped I would really still be interested in phages, but it's possible to be interested in something when you're not interested. That's in. right. But what I was going to ask you about you know, Caltech... It's like being you know, in love with a girl and you're not in love with her. Not you really. Can, you can't tell someone. You can't be interested. <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly. Um, about Caltech, though, was it 
your principal goal while you were there to try to get into the RNA business? Oh, uh, sure. The, the, and did, did you talk. hope that the modeling uh, of well, RNA would be a kind of success that was the analog of, yeah, the, sure. of the DNA yeah, thing? Yeah, we wanted to do the same thing. We thought we're going to see cavities on the RNA surface under which the side groups of the amino acids would fit. Uh, Francis, you know, uh, at the end of the early, uh, well, in September of 54, sort of concluded, well, it can't be right because how are you ever going to distinguish, say, glycine from alanine? There's only a methyl group that's only a kilocalorie of, of energy. Uh, uh, the mistake level will be intolerably high. Something else had to be there. So, uh, so Francis, you know, finally proposed the amino acids were stuck to little pieces of nucleic acid which could hydrogen bond. I said, well, life would never get started that way. It's too complicated. Too complicated to have life start. And uh, even Francis uh, never sent the paper to be published in a real journal. It was. Uh, Written up as a note to members of the RNA Thai Club. Yes. Uh, so that was uh, fascinating. Well, we have uh, run out of time, so we'll stop here. It's a pleasure having you here. Okay. The preceding program has been made possible by financial support from the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation.